Hi, I'm Jennifer Jagger. I am a PALS instructor from the Rick Simulation Center in Terre Haute, and I'm going to talk to you about care of pediatric shock and hypoperfusion. There's my contact information if you have any questions. Uh, shock is a critical condition that results from inadequate tissue delivery of oxygen nutrients to meet the tissue's metabolic demands. That is your basic definition. It can come from inadequate blood volume or oxygen carrying capacity, inappropriate distribution of blood volume and flow, impaired uh, cardiac contractility, or obstructed blood flow. And we're going to break that down into more simple terms. Uh, the child having fever, infection, injury, respiratory distress, and pain all make the shock worse. Uh, that's because it's causing increased demand for oxygen and nutrients on the tissue. The goal for treating shock is to improve oxygen delivery. That's basically what your goal is. So it's character characterized by an effect on the systolic pressure. Compensated shock has a systolic blood pressure within normal range. So when you're calculating systolic blood pressure for children, it's 70 plus two times their age in years for children aged one to 10. Um, for over 10, you go with adult parameters. For less than one, your goal is for the blood pressure to be greater, the systolic blood pressure to be greater than 70. So compensated shock means your blood pressure is in normal range, but there are signs of inadequate tissue perfusion. So these are the signs you're gonna be looking for in assessment um, when you're assessing your pediatric patient that comes in. Uh, tachycardia, uh, cold, pale, mottled, or diaphoretic skin. Delayed capillary refill, so it's gonna be greater than two to three seconds. Uh, weak peripheral pulses, so you're gonna compare your central pulses to your peripheral pulses. And narrow pulse pressure on your blood pressure. There's not much um, difference between your systolic and diastolic. They're not peeing much. Mom reports she hasn't had many wet diapers or vomiting. So those are all the signs you're, that will tell you the patient's in shock, but still compensated. So hypotensive shock is when uh, the body's physiological attempts to maintain the blood pressure and perfusion are no longer working. The body's done what it can, so your blood pressure is starting to change. Uh, and one of the key clinical signs is the changes in level of consciousness. They just aren't acting as they should. You should expect a toddler to be scared of you and they're not acting afraid when you come in the room. Early recognition and rapid intervention are critical to stopping that progression from compensated shock to hypotensive shock because that's quickly gonna lead into cardiac arrest. Some warning signs that the progression is happening from compensated to hypotensive. Uh, your tachycardia is getting worse. Your heart rate was in the 160s and now you're in the 190s. Uh, diminishing or absent peripheral pulses, you're having a harder and harder time finding those uh, radio pulses. Weakening central pulses, you're having a harder time finding your femorals or your brachial pulses. Uh, a narrowing pulse pressure, when you take a blood pressure, um, those numbers are getting closer and closer together. Cold distal extremities with prolonged capillary refill. Uh, decreasing level of consciousness, they're getting uh, less and less interactive, and then the, the blood pressure uh, dropping is going to be a late finding. So your goals for managing shock, and this is all types of shock, improve oxygen delivery. So per PALS guidelines, 100% non-rebreather on everyone is going to improve oxygen delivery. You want to balance tissue perfusion and metabolic demand. You want to re reverse any perfusion abnormalities. You want to restore organ function, and you want to prevent that progression to cardiac arrest. So we're going to talk about the fundamentals of shock. You're optimizing the oxygen content of the blood. You're improving volume of the blood and, distribu and distribution of cardiac output. Reduce oxygen demands and correct metabolic derangements. High concentration oxygen non-rebreather to deliver 100% O2. Um, you can do invasive or non-invasive mechanical ventilation as appropriate. And then if their hemoglobin's low, because that's what's carrying your oxygen, you wanna consider a packed red blood cell transfusion. <clears throat> 
to improve the volume and the distribution of your cardiac output if you're dealing with hypovolemic shock, uh, rapid administration of isotonic crystalloids. So that is your infusion of normal saline or lactated ringers. Distributive shock or septic shock, also rapid administration of isotonic crystalloids, but also you're probably gonna need to add some vasopressors. Cardiogenic shock, it's pretty rare in children, um, but you might see uh, a child that's been in SVT for some hours. Slow infusion of fluids, um, inotropic and vasodilator therapy, and you wanna consult experts early, so you're gonna be calling for transport very quickly on that one. Obstructive shock, um, probably the most common in kids on that one's gonna be attention pneumothorax, maybe from a trauma. You wanna support cardiovascular function, you wanna identify what the problem is and treat the cause. So ways to reduce oxygen demand on the body. Um, you wanna address the common causes of increased oxygen demand. So increased work of breathing, pain and anxiety and fever. So support breathing as they're comfortable. Some kids are more comfortable with a nasal cannula. They don't like the feel of a mask all the way around their face. Um, some kids will let their mom hold the mask up to their face, but they don't want that band around their head. So whatever's comfortable for them. Um, consider uh, sedatives or analgesics, but be careful that you don't knock out any respiratory drive. Um, controlling the fever with uh, Tylenol or other cooling measures, maybe ask mom to take the fleece blanket off. You don't want them to shiver, but you, they shouldn't have too many layers on. And use parents, you know, if you need to put a Band-Aid on something, ask the mom to do it. Generally, kids don't want a stranger near them, so anytime that you can avoid being in their uh, personal space, you're going to decrease their anxiety and fear. Uh, correcting metabolic uh, derangements, hypoglycemia, this is a big one. Kids use a lot of sugar, so if their glucose is low, you can easily correct that. Um, and if it's extremely low, it can lead to seizures and brain injury. Hypocalcemia, it's essential for cardiac function, so that may be something you want to check, uh, look into. Obviously, you're going to do a series of electrolytes. Hyperkalemia. Um, that's gonna result from renal dysfunction, acidosis, you're gonna have that, and then metabolic acidosis on your blood gas. Um, it's gonna develop when you have a production of acids from the tissue perfusion being inadequate. It can be caused by renal or GI dysfunction. So you wanna just keep the history in your head, um, things that mom have told you that may give you clues as to what's going on. So how do you know that you've treated um, the shock? You have a normal heart rate and blood pressure for age. You have normal pulses. So your peripheral pulses and your uh, peripheral pulses are equal. Your capillary refill time is less than two seconds. Their extremities are warm. They're behaving appropriate for their age. The urine output is adequate. The lactate has normalized and the base deficit is reduced. So now we're going to talk about the management of shock. Um, we want to position them um, appropriately, airway and breathing, vascular access, fluid resuscitation, of course, monitoring and frequent reassessment, any labs that you might do, medication therapy, and then consultation. The most common um, shock in children is hypovolemic shock. Uh, there's many reasons that they may be low on fluids. Diarrhea and vomiting are very common. Uh, hemorrhage um, from trauma, and that could be internal bleeding or external bleeding. Inadequate fluid intake, frequently you see that. Um, we see that frequently here in children that have had a tonsillectomy. They start refusing to drink, and then the longer they go without drinking, the more it hurts to drink. So you kind of have a vicious cycle. DKA. Maybe kids have been undiagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Third space fluid loss and large burns. So any of those scenarios, you're going to have low blood circulating in the vessels. Signs of hypovolemic shock. Um, they do have a patent airway. They may be breathing fast, but you don't see any signs of respiratory distress. The lung sounds are clear. Um, there's no mucus drainage. Chest x-ray looks normal. They don't have a history of asthma, but they're breathing fast. 
tachycardia, and that heart's pounding away, that pump's trying to pump faster to get more blood through when they just don't have enough volume. Um, initially, you're gonna have an adequate systolic blood pressure, or you might have some systolic hypotension and the pulse pressure is going to be narrow. Um, weak or absent peripheral pulses, so you want to check those. Normal or weak central pulses, delayed capillary refill, so you're looking for a cap refill time of two to three seconds. Cool pale mottled skin um, and also diaphoresis, that's pretty common. Uh, dusky pale extremities, uh, changes in level of consciousness, and again, not enough urine output. Mom reports there hasn't been a wet diaper today, things like that. And again, changes in level of consciousness when you have a toddler that should be scared of you and totally doesn't care what's happening or not fighting you on getting a blood pressure, things like that wouldn't be normal. More specific symptoms for hypovolemic shock. Um, their eyes appear sunken, they have dark circles under their eyes, their lips are bright red, their mucous membranes are maybe completely dry, their mouth is sticky. You can check their skin elasticity. Um, and with children less than 15, 18 months old, you can check their fontanelle. Um, you, to appropriately assess the fontanelle, the baby should be at a 45 degree angle and you assess whether it's flat level with the plates of the skull, or if it's sunken in, that would be a sign of hypovolemia. So treatment of non-hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock. They have um, have a history of vomiting and diarrhea. Uh, they have an explanation for why there would be um, dehydration with no signs of blood loss. So your treatment would be normal saline or lactated ringers, 20 cc's per kilo over 10 to 20 minutes. When that infusion's done, you wanna reassess your pulses, you wanna reassess your capillary refill, you wanna reassess the level of consciousness. If those things are not improved, you're gonna repeat that bolus again. And again, reassess is key. And you can re, uh, repeat that bolus a third time. Kids generally improve very quickly. If you get their fluid levels normal, they feel good in no time. Um, if there's not failure to improve after three boluses, the fluid loss is underestimated. Um, you need to reassess what type of fluid repl replacement you need to do. Um, your assumptions about the cause of their shock may need to be reassessed. You may need to seek a uh, specialty consultation. So hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock. There was a trauma, there has been bleeding, you know that they've lost blood. So based on that, knowing a child's estimated blood volume is about 75 cc's per kilo, and that's how much fluid they have, maybe there can be some estimation of how much they've lost. You want to give, um, if you're using, excuse me, fluid replacement, you wanna give about three milliliters of the crystalloid, the normal saline or LR, for every one milliliter of blood loss. Um, so three boluses may be what's necessary to replace 25% blood loss. However, if you have packed red blood cells available, that would be more appropriate, more ideal, and that bolus is 10 milliliters per kilo. Distributive shock, um, moving on. That's your septic shock. It's characterized by uh, an inappropriate distribution of blood volume with inadequate organ and tissue perfusion. So the common forms are, like I said, what you're gonna see is septic shock, possibly anaphylactic shock, or maybe uh, rarely neurogenic shock. <clears throat> um, in septic, you're gonna have vasodilation and venodilation in the venous system um, with increased capillary permeability. So, um, the blood vessels have lost their tone and they're leaky, so your blood isn't staying really where you want it to. In anaphylactic shock, there's venodilation, arterial vasodilation, and increased capillary permeability, along with pulmonary vasoconstriction that reduces cardiac output. So that kid has a lot of things going on to correct. Um, in neurogenic shock, they just have a generalized loss of vascular tone, um, that's usually following a cervical spine injury. The cause uh, may not allow, the injury may not allow the heart rate to increase to help compensate for that hypotension. So that's especially dangerous and thankfully the least frequently seen. 
For distributive shock, you want to make sure the patient has a patent airway. Um, know that they're going to have tachypnea, and again, usually without increased work of breathing, <clears throat> unless they have a pneumonia that's caused this, so know that that's a possibility. They're going to have tachycardia. With distributive shock, you're going to have bounding pulses, so kind of opposite of the other type. Um, they may have brisk capillary refill if they're in warm shock, or they have delayed capillary refill of cold shock. So, so warm shock is going to be the warm flush skin because the blood vessels are all dilated, or um, pale mottled skin and delayed capillary refill if there's not much circulation to the to the to the skin. <clears throat> You're going to have hypotension. Um, with a wide pulse pressure in warm shock, and again, a narrow pulse pressure in cold shock. You could even have a normal blood pressure. They are going to have a change in level of consciousness, like we've talked about, not enough urine output. Um, kids sometimes have a fever when they're sick, or their temperature goes low when they're very sick. And then also you want to watch for the purpuric rash. So your goals of treatment for septic shock, distributive shock, is restore hemodynamic stability and you want to identify and control the infection. So initial treatment, the 100% O2 non-rebreather if possible, support ventilation as necessary, monitor their respiratory status, um, monitor all their vital signs. Very, very important in treatment of shock is establish vascular access. Um, the general rule of thumb in a kid who has hypotensive shock that you need quick access is allow two to three minutes to access a site peripherally and if those are unsuccessful go directly to an IO. Know that in distributive or septic shock three or four boluses in the first hour wouldn't be uncommon. So you would give a bolus reassess, give a bolus reassess and it wouldn't be un uncommon to give four in that first hour. Um, continued treatment would be monitor your electrolytes and correct those as necessary. Um, get cultures and then give antibiotics early. Consider a vasopressor drip and possibly a hydrocortisone. Likely you're going to get uh, consult expert um, advice on that. A second vascular access site would be a good idea. Identify and correct any metabolic derangements and then more diagnostic tests to make sure we're treating the right thing and normalizing everything. Um, the treatment of anaphylactic shock is I am epi. A second dose or an epi infusion may be needed in severe cases. You can give a normal saline bolus. You can use albuterol as needed for any bronchospasms. Um, antihistamines, an H1 blocker in addition to an H2 blocker, and corticosteroids. Treatment of neurogenic shock, um, allow the child a position of comfort if they're stable. If not, place in Trendelenburg if it doesn't compromise breathing. High concentration oxygen, non-rebreather again, that 100% O2 is never a bad idea in a PAL situation. Consider CPAP, um, non-invasive PPV or mechanical ventilation. Um, you could administer a trial of a bolus and reassess and assess response use vasopressors as indicated, <clears throat> and then provide supplementary warming or cooling as needed to normalize the temperature. We're gonna talk about cardiogenic shock, and, and again, this one isn't seen very frequently. Probably the most common thing would be SVT or a child who has a history of congenital heart disease, and in that case, frequently the parents are gonna know more than you do, <laughs> more than any of us do. <clears throat> Signs are going to be tachypnea and increased respiratory effort with this one. They're going to have retractions, flaring, grunting, and that's going to be from the pulmonary edema. So you're going to be ruling out several things. They're going to have tachycardia, uh, a normal or a low blood pressure with a narrow pulse pressure. <clears throat> Weak or absent peripheral pulses, again, the signs of shock, delayed capillary refill, cold extremities, um, signs of congestive um, heart failure. Possibly, you know, depending on their age, you could see jugular vein distension, but of course toddlers have a short fat neck. It's kind of hard to see. Hepatomegaly, you should not be able to fill the liver in children. So if you can fill their liver, um, that's going to be a positive sign. Um, pulmonary edema, maybe you can see on chest x-ray here, crackles. 
cyanosis, again, the cold, pale, mottled skin, uh, an inappropriate level of consciousness, and not enough urine output. So critical concept in cardiogenic shock. Um, the increased respiratory effort often, often distinguishes cardiogenic from hypovolemic, but then also you have to discern it from respiratory emergencies. Hypovolemic shock is characterized by tachypnea without increased worker breathing, but uh, cardiogenic shock is going to have, that child's going to have retractions, grunting, and using their accessory muscles. And also in cardiogenic shock, there's going to be a decreased arterial O2 sat because of that pulmonary edema. So specific treatments improve the effectiveness of the cardiac function and minimize metabolic demand. So again, we're keeping them calm, we're keeping any pain under control, we're keeping their temperature normalized. <clears throat> Gradual fluid resuscitation, so this bolus is gonna be lower and slower. So five to 10 milliliters per kilo over 10 to 20 minutes. You're gonna give oxygen, you're gonna assess for the pulmonary edema, you're gonna call for expert consultation early. Um, there are meds to improve myocardial dysfunction. Maybe they need a dose of Lasix, maybe they need milrinone, and diagnostic studies, um, an echo, chest x-ray, those kinds of things, an ABG, and mechanical circulatory support, which is gonna happen at a, a more specialized children's hospital. Obstructive shock is our next topic. Uh, the cardiac output is impaired by physical obstruction of blood flow. So something's causing the heart to be squeezed so that it's not able to pump. Examples would include a cardiac tamponade, a tension pneumothorax, or a ductal dependent congenital heart defect. The main objectives in your management is to correct the cause of your obstruction of cardiac output, obviously, and then you're going to restore tissue, <coughs> tissue perfusion. Specifically, a cardiac tamponade, um, if you're going to have a good outcome, that requires rapid ID and immediate treatment. Um, giving the fluid administration the fluid bol bolus, it's going to give you a temporary improvement, and then things are going to go back to where they were. Your reassessment is very important. Consult a specialist early. Get them on the phone. Pericardial drainage guided by ultrasound or fluoroscopy is the treatment. And an emergency periocardiocentesis can be performed in the event of impending or actual pulseless arrest. So recognize early, get a transport team, specialty team on the way. Um, tension pneumothorax, I would think this would be the most common that you would see. Uh, treatment would be an immediate needle decompression and then followed by chest tube placement. So uh, this is more specifically covered in PALS in detail, but an 18 to 20 gauge angiocath over the top of the child's third rib, second uh, intercostal space on the midclavicular line of the affected side. <clears throat> um, congenital heart defects, um, and specifically a ductal dependent lesion. If you have a newborn, who's brought into your facility and you are seeing signs of this cardiogenic shock. Um, you're, you're seeing the pulmonary edema, maybe you're seeing a, a hepatomegaly, and this is a newborn. Um, what may be happening is they have a ductal dependent lesion and that ductus is closing. Um, in fetal circulation, as you see on the left, the ductus arteriosus is um, an opening that as a fetus is normal to be open between the aorta and the pulmonary arteries. And as the baby, once the cord is clamped, pressures change and over the next hours to few days, that opening gradually closes. When that closes, the baby no longer has any mixing of blood and they're going to, ha they're going to have a cyanotic episode um, and the heart's gonna have a lot of problems delivering oxygenated blood to the baby's body. Um, so there are, once this is recognized, it's important to give a medication called prostaglandins quickly that will, it's a hormone that allows that ductus to stay open until the child can have surgery to repair this. So again, early recognition is important. Um, your key age in this is going to be days old and you need to uh, consult a transport team to come pick up this patient early. Thank you.